Amen. Go ahead, grab your seat, pick up your Bible, find in your Old Testament a book called First Kings. First Kings this morning. Find in your Bible a book called First Kings. If you get to Second Kings, you went too far. First Kings. First Kings chapter 19 this morning. Amen. Let's begin our journey on what will be a very long sermon. If you have your, if you have your Bible, have it to 1 Kings 19. If you, if you didn't get an outline when you came in, if you'll raise your hand, one of our guys right up here, Coop, there in the back, we need some more help with the, with the outlines. We have some. Get in without outlines. I'll get you one, Barbara. Amen. Up here, Brother Chris. Oh, you got it? Amen. Had it. We need one over here with Shannon, girl. Amen. Here comes Junior. Junior to the rescue. First Kings 19. I draw your attention to verses 13 through 18. Is it is them fans on? Amen. Well, we'll be glad for what we got. <laughs> Don't ever ask a, a church. Is it hot or cold? Because you'll have, your, you'll have a church split. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel, the king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth, that has not kissed him. Now, if you didn't get the opportunity to be with us in services about November or so, then you did not hear a lot of the sermons I preached over this chapter. Uh, to catch you up real quick, about back in the fall, I was really seeking a time with the Lord for, for a tomorrow. If the Lord tears is coming, what do we need to be moving towards? Of course, we're expecting God to to come back and that's what our prayer is but we want to be found watching we want to be found witnessing we want to be found waiting and we want to be found working amen when the lord comes back and we want to be working on what his will is for us it's his prerogative to do as he wants in our lives whether he comes back while we're young or old calls us to through the grave whether we're young or we're old that that's in the lord's hands but but we want to be found faithful amen I don't want my master to come back and find me slothful. I want my master to find me faithful. I was praying and asking the Lord for for an idea of vision, uh, a direction. I didn't want anything that was short-sighted. So many times in my life in ministry, things that I was just sure would take 20 years, God did in 20 months, and uh, and those kinds of things. And I wanted something that that, that was going to carry me through so I could be a good pastor to you. And... uh, there were things the Lord was stirring my heart with, and He confirmed them with this passage of Scripture. When I went off praying, there were three things I was thinking about, and the fourth thing was a passage of Scripture. And I told the Lord this. I said, Lord, I'm not a smart man, but I know this, that if your answer is, is coming my way, it'll be found in your Word. And 1 Kings 19 is where the Word was. Now, I didn't really appreciate that from the Lord, uh, just to be quite honest. Because when the Lord told me 
about 1 Kings 19 as my heart was stirred. You see, I know what that story was about. I knew that that, that found the man of God hiding in a cave. And we can get in a cave. And sometimes we get in a cave and we don't want to admit we're in a cave. We was looking in RV on Tuesday night. By the way, RV, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We've relaunched it, having a great time. How about, if you were there last week, can I get an amen? amen? Amen. Come out in the ice and snow, they did. We had a great time, but we talked about denial. We talked about, about a false system of belief. And you can get to live in your life that way where you think you're not in a cave when you're in a cave. And that's, if you're in a cave, you might as well look around and see the damp walls and call it what it is. You don't want to live your life thinking you're somewhere that you're not. You don't want to be living in the future. You don't want to be living in the past. You've got to be living in the now. Amen? Don't act like your greatest days was behind you if God still got you living and breathing. Amen? Amen. They may be different days, but it don't mean that they, don't, that they can't be even better days. Amen? Y'all kind of quiet today. I want you to look at somebody and say, we need you to be loud. Oh, he will talk all day long. All right, you've been warned. Elijah in his cave probably felt a very long way from the Lord's blessing, from the Lord's purposes, from the Lord's power. He probably felt like maybe he had messed up too bad. He knew his fellowship with the Lord wasn't as it should be. This man had stood and saw the fire of God come and devour the sacrifices. He had saw the rain break as he spoke to the Lord about it. The man had literally outrun a chariot of horses down a mountain. But when he got down on the, in the valley and he, and he got through with the big day, what Elijah found out was that the Lord let the devil wake up the next day. And while he might have had a great Sunday, have you ever had a great Sunday with a terrible Monday? I raised two hands to that one. I've had, I have seen some of my greatest days on a Sunday. I've seen some of my worst days on a Monday. You're like, how can it go from so good to so bad so quick? Well, it's just a matter of taking your eyes off of he that gave you the good moment and putting your eyes on the difficulties of this life. And the next thing you know, Elijah saw Jezebel and he took off running. God helped him get to the cave. Elijah run off with no food, no nothing. He run, he run so long, so hard, he run himself smooth out of strength. God had to send an angel to give him something to eat, and God didn't even do nothing but let him fall right back to sleep. Then he fed him again, and the Bible says he went in the strength of that meal 40 days, and he finds himself on Mount Sinai. Very place that God had given the law. Mountain range called Horeb. And there he finds a cave, and he goes down in it. He's hiding from Jezebel. He's down. He feels like he's probably out. I would say he probably felt as, as far away from the blessing of God as he had probably ever felt in his life. If you'll notice on your outline today, I would encourage you with this. We are probably closer than we feel. Because the Lord is good. Can I get a witness? The Lord is good. The Lord's mercy endureth forever. It is renewed day by day. And the, the bad thing is, is that the old devil woke up on Monday and there he was working in Jezebel. But praise God, God's mercy was new that Monday. And the day that he woke up in the cave, God's mercy was new. And it says in verse 12 that, that God sent a voice. In fact, what had happened was God had asked Elijah a question and Elijah had gave an answer and God gave a command and that was to come out of the cave and Elijah didn't move we see a fire a wind an earthquake big events but the scripture here points out that the Lord was not in those things but then a still small voice and when he heard the still small voice in verse 13 we see him move and we see God help him and we see God blessing. The message I want to share with you this morning is a message for each and every one of us individually and a message for our church in particular as we look towards a tomorrow, as we look towards a future. But let's just find those things as we, we see them. I draw your attention in verse 13 to a small change. There on your outline, a small change. There's a, a small, almost unnoticeable change 
change in the situation. God had asked a question, Elijah had given an answer. In this story we've read, this part of the story we've read, God is going to ask the same question again, and Elijah is going to give the same answer again. But there is a difference. And the difference is the position that Elijah now takes. And there on your outline, I would just say this, a small change in position can make all the difference. A small change in position. Look at it. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood. I have that underlined in my Bible. He went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And here the Lord comes back again. God had asked him a question. Elijah gave an answer. God had told him come out of the cave. Elijah didn't come out of the cave. God demonstrates his power, but then he blesses him with his presence in a still small voice and when Elijah hears that voice he moves he didn't move far I, I don't think he had strength to move far we all know from his answer that his despondency hadn't left him because he gives the exact same answer in verse 14 that he had given earlier he, he feels the same the greatest lessons I ever learned is you can still obey God whether you feel like it or not you can obey God, and God can have a plan for you even if you don't feel right. So much of the time, I ran around first looking for the feeling to confirm what God was saying. Well, if God is speaking to me, Danny, then I ought to be feeling all holy and whatnot, right? I ought to be feeling revived. But let me tell you what, you can obey even when you don't feel revived. In fact, if you want to get revived, you've got to take the small steps first. You've got to begin with obedience. Elijah didn't do anything but move from in a cave to the door of the cave, but praise God, God saw him move. I was saved with a move. God had called me a long time, but I was not saved until I took a move. As an 11-year-old boy, as insignificant as that is, in a place called Rosser that is as insignificant as it is, in a building that's not even there anymore, as insignificant as that is, I let go of the back of a pew. Those of y'all don't know what pews are, them's church benches. I know some of y'all ain't ever seen them. We won't ever have them. Amen. Amen. We got, we got a nice little chair. We can move them around. Brother David loves to move these chairs all over the place. I'm the one that's got the chair of moving problem. But anyway, I let go of the back of that bench, and I took a step. And if you've ever heard me tell my testimony before, guys, I know now that that's when I was saved. I was saved. I was lost here and saved here. Little step. In the cave, at the door. In the cave, made a move. Little step. God knew my heart. He recognized my weakness but was still willing to bless me. Elijah was closer to the Lord's blessing than he knew. You say, Brother Todd, what does that have to do with me? Well, if you're lost and God's calling you, well, you're closer than you think. If you're backslid, you are a prayer away from it being better than it's ever been. You are a step away. If you're wanting to break that that addiction. You're wanting to break that hurt. You're wanting to break that hang-up. You're wanting to break that whatever it is that's keeping you from living life the way you want to live it. You're, you're, you're maybe just a step away. I, I talked about RV earlier. Maybe it's just the Tuesday night getting the car and come on. Maybe it's, well, I don't know what it's going to be like. Hey, Elijah didn't know what it was going to be like when he walked to the cave. He didn't know if God was going to kill him out there or God was going to bless him out there. But one thing I think the brother recognized was he could not live in a hole. He had to make a move. We're made to move. We're made to act. We're made to do. I know your marriage may be a wreck. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. But two people standing off in two different places thinking it's the end will be the end. Somebody don't think God ain't got the power to restore a marriage, get you over hurts, get you over things. You say, well, Brother Todd, it's their problem. I got news for you, baby, unless God don't soften your heart, 
what they had as a problem, even if it gets fixed, will never be forgiven by you and you'll never have any kind of marriage. I ain't saying your daddy wasn't sorry. I ain't saying you didn't have a mean mama. I'm not saying you didn't have any mama. But what I'm saying is, is with a step, if you are hearing a call, excuse me, in any way, it's time to take that step. I just realized I'm growing a beard. Amen. Thank you. I was reading my Bible the other day, and the Word of God said that a gray hair, a gray head, is a crown of glory. And then it said, if it's found in the way of wisdom. <laughs> so if y'all see me cut it off, you know I've been acting a fool. Hopefully this microphone won't short out. I read an article the other day that said if you will grow ha facial hair, you look thinner. I decided I'd grow the beard and eat the pizza. So anyway. Would you look at somebody and say a small change? Look at somebody else and say it can make all the difference. Are you willing to step? Come on now. You know, as a church, there's a lot of things we, 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 we're thinking about, a lot of things we want to see. But baby, it, it, it's just the small steps. God blesses in the small steps. The things really we want to see done over the next 25, 30 years, if the Lord tears is coming, they're bigger than we can imagine. We don't have the money for it. We don't, we don't have the people for it right now. But, 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 it, but, it, but it can happen if we'll take a step. Verse 14, we see an honest confession. Now, it wasn't a true confession, but it was honest. And you say, Brother Todd, how can it be one and not the other? Well, look at what Elijah said. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. Children of Israel forsaken your covenant. They torn down your altars. They killed your prophets. All that's true. But then he says this, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Now, when... Elijah said that, he meant it. When Elijah said it, he thought it. Well, that's why I say he was honest. With as far as he knew and had convinced himself of negative things that there was no other prophet left in Israel. And it, when Jezebel got a hold of him, that'd be the end of it. Now, God's going to tell him later, and he hadn't told him this yet, but he's going to touch on it in verse 18. That I got 7,000 ain't bowed down. You just don't know him, Elijah. So it wasn't a true statement, but it was honest. He was wrong, but he wasn't intentionally wrong. I like the how the, the brother has the guts to give God the same answer he gave him before. Same question, same answer. Elijah might have said this, I'm at the door. I've stepped out, but Lord, I feel the same way I felt. But I would notice, have you noticed in, at the end there of, of number two, that God responds to the smallest step of obedience. Elijah still felt the same, but there was something happening Elijah could not know. And that is, is as he obeyed, God was going to have something for him to do. The smallest step of obedience. Even though the brother felt bad. E even though the brother felt destitute. I, I don't think the Lord is into us faking it until we make it. I always caution people when, they, when we talk like this, but... If you're mad at the Lord, and, I, and, and, and I'm going to tell you that is a foolish thing. That is a silly thing. It is a childish thing. But if it is there, if that is how you feel, you need to express that to God. Now, be mindful of who you're talking to. You ain't talking to your Facebook friends. The Bible says we can approach the throne of grace and find grace to help in a time of need. Just remember it is a throne. I would just give you that. But if you feel down, the Lord don't want you coming into church acting like everything's right. Elijah, at least, was still long-faced with the Lord. He still gave the same answer to the Lord. 
He didn't say, well, now, Lord, that since I've made it to the cave, I just feel all better. You know what? I, I, I need some church. I need some good music. I just need some happy music. I'll be all right. I've seen too many Christians walk into church long-faced, leave church long-faced in the middle, hands up, singing loud, dancing all over the place. That's an act. You've got conditions. I've seen some of them, they'll come run to the altar, but they act the same when they leave. Every week, run to the altar, act the same when they leave. You've gotten conditions. You, you, you don't know it, but you're playing church. I got news. If you play in church, you're further away than you feel. But if you'll be here and be honest today, even if your heart's broken, your mind's messed up, you're mad, you're upset, whatever it is, if you will be real with God, Number three, on your outline, we see a renewed commission. Elijah had been God's prophet. God still uses him as a prophet. He tells him what he wants him to go do next. Notice there is no correction here. It does not, no words here about, well, I noticed you answered me the same way. There's nothing here about, I see that you're still down. It's just a commission. The Lord said to him, Go anoint Haziel, verse 16, Go anoint Jehu, and the end of verse 16, And go anoint Elisha. Two kings and a prophet. One a Gentile king, one the king of Israel, the other the prophet that was going to take his place. You will anoint him, it says there at the end, as prophet in your place. Elijah, your time is going to come to an end, but my time's not going to be over in the world. I'm going to pass it from one to the next. I'm going to bring you home. Sometimes we get upset about the Lord letting us deal with death. Of course, Elijah didn't die, but he did get translated. We lose folks we love. We forget that they're created for heaven. Sometimes it's too early for us. We have to remember that it's right on time with the Lord. I don't like losing them young. I'm going to tell you, I don't like losing them old. But we've got to remember that the Lord has saved us for heaven, not saved us for here. And the only time we'll be back here is when He makes it a new heaven and a new earth. But that's another sermon. I would just say to you there at the, underneath the, the verses 15 and 16, do you see where it says God is not blank? You see it? Just two of you? You got it! I've been too slack. God is not done with me. And I didn't, I, on that little line, I wanted to say us. In fact, my first thought was you, and then us. But then I wrote down me. God is not done with you, baby. You say, Brother Todd, I ain't the Christian I ought to be. I started out to be a great Christian, Brother Todd. I, I really, I love the Lord. I thank Him for saving me. I had these big plans to do for the Lord. And man, I don't know what happened. Just like life kind of got me. I messed up. I've fallen. I'm going to tell you something, baby. When you hadn't done any living in the kingdom, it's easy to talk about what you're going to be in the kingdom. It's another thing when you bear the heat of the day. It's another thing when you have lost those that you love. That you thought you was going to have good company serving the Lord and your husband or your wife passed on. You was looking at leaving a lineage with your children and one of them or more is passed on. You thought, oh my God, God's giving me grandchildren. Maybe you've buried one of them. You started out to do so well. You never thought you'd ever backslide, but you did. You have. You think, well, I thought I was over my addiction, Brother Todd. I thought I'd be over it. I got saved. I thought, I'd, man, I'd never even want no more heroin. And then, Brother Todd, I'm telling you, I know I'm saved, as crazy as it sounds, and some people don't believe me. Brother Todd, I was saved, and I got back on that stuff. I say, amen. Oh, yeah, they don't know where in the Word of God does it say if you get saved, you'll never, you'll never, you'll never battle addiction again. 
you don't want to, you fight it, the Spirit of God fights it in you, it makes you miserable while we're in sin. Brother Todd, some, somebody's uh, being raptured or something. They're going to all buzz. It's okay if it's an amber alert. Praise God. Maybe it'll help somebody find somebody that's in a bad spot. Mine's probably back there going off too. So David, turn it off if you don't mind. Dear Lord, we just pray if that is anything bad or difficult, we pray your hand would be on those that may be being hurt. We pray it's no storm or nothing like that. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that if it is some child or somebody in difficulty somewhere that you're guardian angels be upon them we not let the evil one touch them in any way we pray that in jesus name everybody said amen. amen john the baptist jesus says was the greatest prophet born of women no greater ever rose the lord said and jesus would know remember what happened with old john they threw him in prison. It got dark. He sent some of his disciples to Jesus. Said, are you the one we're looking for? Or do we look for another? Now, before he was in jail, Andrew and them and John and them was walking around, and he said, look, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Oh, he knew exactly who Jesus was, but when he got, when he got tough, he, he got to fretting, he got to doubting, he got to being, being down. Lord told him. I'm accomplishing my plan. And, he, and, and, and without going all into it, he said, he said and, and blessed is anybody that's not offended in me. In other words, blessed is anybody that lets me be God and lets me lead, even though it was leading to John losing his head. Didn't mean John didn't love the Lord. Didn't mean God didn't have a plan for him. Doesn't mean we're not going to see the brother home. Well, I'd like to walk in the same company with a John the Baptist when I get home. Elijah's home. The Lord carried his home. Some of y'all, y'all stuff works late. <laughs> you need to get us a new sales signal. Get you a new carrier. The Elijah was in a cave, but Elijah was translated in a, in a chair to fire. He shows up and ministers to Jesus while Jesus is on a mountain. Moses and Elijah show up. It looks to me like the Lord brought him back into blessing. James told us that there was no difference in Elijah and us, that he was a man of like passions, difficulties, situations as we are, but he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain. God's not done with you. God doesn't waste that hurt. Yeah, it may not have been, and it was not God's will for you to backslide, but don't you think for a second God can't pick it up and use it? God didn't want your marriage having difficulty, but don't think God can't use it. In this sin-cursed world, there's a lot of things happen outside of God's perfect will, but don't think for a minute that God can't use it. It was never God's will for Stephen Stubbs to be drunk and high on a Saturday night, but he was saved the next day. And now it's part of his story. I'm recounting it even to you now. It was never God's will for David Patrick to be a drug dealer and a, and, and, and a drug abuser. But it's part of a testimony now. The brother that's running these screens here for you tonight is the man I'm talking about. My brother-in-law sitting there with him, spent many years in, in, uh, in uh, addiction. Drugs and different things would come back from Vietnam. And he's sitting there running one of these, this big middle screen. You can have a place. It's not over. Don't let the devil convince you God's done with you. Now, it may change. You know, brother, you've been married seven times. Nobody's probably going to have you as a pastor. And they don't need to. You ain't even qualified. That's, and that's not being mean. It's just, it may be different, but let, let God's big enough to still bless it, even if it's different. But don't be content to sit on the sidelines of life. 
if the Lord wants to do something with you. But number four, as we look at verse 17, we see a promise of completion. Now, Elijah was very worried about trouble getting his way. And what God tells him is, is, I tell you what, whoever gets away from Haziel, Jehu will kill him. Whoever gets away from Jehu, Elisha will kill him. Don't worry about it. If, I, if people are after you, don't mean nothing, Elijah. I got people that will take care of that. Don't worry about it. I'm going to complete what I'm, what my will is. And there on your outline, where God's will is, His power is. God never told Elijah, I'm going to make sure that nobody, that you have this supernatural strength and you'll be able to fight off your enemies. No, you go out and do what I'm telling you to do and I'm going to, I'm going to have them people are going to be the ones that run the protection that, that you need. Your blessing is going to come in obeying what I say to do. When you go out and do, Elijah, what I want you to do, then you're going to have the power you need, and we're going to see the power come in the kingdom like it needs to come. Now, if you were here in November, you know that I talked a lot about this. God gave me a word. As odd as it sounds, and you'll always know when you get a rhema because you can't make it fit but it just fits when you get it we built this building off a word that god gave me from zachariah chapter four many christians didn't even know there was a zachariah in the bible but there he is it's right after the book of hesitation uh, just checking i was looking to see if some of y'all went for the table of contents huh you find hesitations right after first and second theologians. Now y'all are looking. Quit it. There's 66 books of the Bible, and those three ain't any of them. The Lord gave me a word about how here we have a prophet of God, of, of Israel, anointing a Gentile king, which we didn't see, we hadn't seen happen in Scripture. But we see God reaching out into the outside. We see him anointing Jehu, and we see the community being impacted. And then we see him anointing Elisha, and we see God's people, the remnant, being, being blessed. In fact, Elisha's going to come, and he's going to have double a portion of, of, of Elijah's power and ability. I said, Brother Todd, why are you telling me all this? One of the things the Lord laid for me was there were two things I was really, really contending on. Starting satellite campuses and, uh, and a school. And I was, I was trying to really get a, a figuring out in time. And one of the things the Lord showed me was that what he told Elijah was, you just go anoint them. Neither one of those men became king until after Elijah was gone. And what the Lord showed me was, Todd, you get it started. I'm, I'm going to bless you one step at a time. It, it, this may happen after you're gone. What I want you doing is laying foundation. And if I will that you live, you lay the foundation and you can start building on it. But you're going to move. Now, Elisha was different. He went out to get Elisha. And God had been burdening me about our church doubling in spirit, in prayer, in salvation, in number, in money, you name it. Just, I, it was just, it was driving me. One of the ways that I knew that when I was reading this is that the Lord was giving me a word because I said, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I came here with three things on my mind. Look at here, you got three men. I know Todd, I can put things together and make it look like your will. But the Lord confirmed some things with me and some other scriptures and, but with, the, but with Elisha doubling. And Elisha asked Elijah, can I have a double portion of your spirit? And, and Elijah told him, said, well, if you see me go up, you'll have it. And, of course, we know that Elijah watched, uh, Elisha watched Elijah go up, and we know that he came back and have a double portion of the Spirit. Anyway, you say, well, Brother Todd, you're just, you're just putting things together. You just had to bend there in the prayer time. Here's all I know. I know cotton-picking well. 
that there are three things God wants me doing the rest of my ministry. I'm going to be reaching into places that we got no business reaching into. And we never saw no prophet from Israel anointing some Gentile king. We're going to reach out in places that a little church in Scurry, Texas, ain't got no business doing. I was wondering if it could happen, Danny, and we had that church in Dallas call us about joining up with them. I thought, cotton picking, if a group of people over here in a rich part of Dallas will reach down to Victory Church, Lord, I don't know if this is the time or not. And I told them, David was sitting in the meeting. I said, I don't know if it's with y'all, but what God's told me is, is, boy, don't you worry about it. I can make it happen when I want it to happen. To lay the foundation for a school, we've already got that going. The, the, uh, the preschools got started. We've got a good little group getting started off. Can't wait till next year. We're just going to try to add it, add it, add it. I hope and pray that we have one of the strongest preparatory schools, Christian preparatory schools that, that, that this state has ever seen. And it can happen, and it can, it don't, we don't have to be in the rich part of town, and we ain't all got to be rich for it to happen. If God blesses us and, and, and we see it happen, we can see young people blessed in powerful, mighty ways to the point of changing our community in ways that we had never seen. I want to see and I know it can happen where our children and the people that come that, 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 that learn and grow under the, under the banner of Jesus Christ excel ahead in, I mean, science, math, literatures, arts, you name it, athletics, everything. God's already given us the land. We didn't do anything but just pray about it. Gave it to us. We still got 60 grand in the bank to clear the land off with, Danny. Just out of nowhere. Me, Danny, Gary, Chris Cox went over and signed the papers. Chris had to go back to work. <laughs> Poor rascal that he is. Anyway, so Chris goes back to work, and me and Danny and, and, and Gary and Vernon are standing there leaning over the truck, and I'm going to tell you, boys, I felt like I just robbed the 7-Eleven. I, was, I said, we done robbed the bank. They're going to be coming after us. Can y'all believe this? 28 acres of land. Is, there it is. Sometimes I still pinch myself. It was so weird. You know, my mom was a grovite, so, you know, the first thing I thought of was, I feel like I've robbed a 7-Eleven. I thought, maybe I ought to shoot higher. I used to make Mimi mad. I'd drive by, I'd say, Mimi. I said, I bet me and you could be in and out of that 7-Eleven in five minutes with all the money in the cash register. I said, I know that appeals to you, Mimi. Mimi from the Grove, you know. I said, I know that appeals to you, Mimi. But anyway, I got scolded for that. And all you other Grovites, Jesus loves you. I'm just messing with you. I'm half Grovite. I'm half Grovite. Half Grovite. Can all the Grovites say, yeah? Yeah, yeah Kaufman County. If it wasn't for Pleasant Grove, there'd be no Kaufman County. But anyway. But the other thing was, and in, in particular, and where the Lord was, was really pushing me, and what I know is first, is the doubling in us. And I don't mean just one more person sitting beside you. Now, the 200 more chairs we bought is for that doubling. All the black chairs you see empty around you, those belong to human beings that Jesus died for on the cross. We bought, paid for them, put them in here, provide them just like others provided for us in the church before we came along in the church. Amen? And God ain't going to send nobody else to get them but us. God ain't going to send the good saints over at First Baptist Kaufman to fill our church up. Amen? Amen. Look at somebody and say it's up to us. We need more children's space. Period. We're going to see it. We're about to see an influx of new families. We're about to see an influx of children coming to know Christ and growing and, 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 and prayerfully becoming a great generation in the church. And it's always up to the few to lay up for the many. David, get your brethren if you would. Y'all, everybody, If you got one of them cards, I want you to pass them out. They should be a bunch of y'all. Well, y'all moving slow. Amen. Maybe we should have got a younger crew, David. I don't know. <laughs> Old Dennis over here putting stuff in his pocket. Just take hold of one of these cards. Now, let me just say this. If you're our guest, they're going to hand you a card. Just take it, but I don't want you to do anything with it. This is primarily for our members and our regular attenders. If the Lord lays it on you, that's fine. But I, we, don't, we don't even take offerings here, okay? This little card's about money, so I'm going I'm to tell you that up front. We don't even take offerings here, but this is something very unusual for us. I, want you to, I just want you to have this little card. Next week, what I'd like to do, 
is I'd like to take an offering and take up these cards next week. Not today. We take them up next week. These cards are given to you now so you can pray over them. Pray about them, think about them. We need to pay for that building. I'd like to pay for that building as fast as we can. We already got some lingering debt from this building and our youth building to accumulate a little bit more debt. We probably need to, honest to goodness, we need to, we need to raise about half a million or a little better. And do the buildings, do some remodeling things we need to do. We need to put in a ramp over here, um, uh, a covered driveway. We got, we got too many folks having to walk up that hill and the rain's bad and their health is not good and some of our old folks is too hard for them. Our handicapped people that in wheelchairs and things is too hard for them to get in here. We can put a covered parking deal over here real easy. We can drive in. We'll have a valet team. You, don't, you can just jump out, give them your car, make sure that they have a valet sticker on it that says, I am, I am not a Grovite owner, amen. No, I'm just, I'm just messing, just messing. Couldn't help it, couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. It was sin. It was sin. It was my flesh. It was my flesh. Forgive a brother. I know they do. I ain't, ain't I'm just messing around. Just messing about. But be able to drop. <laughs> One no, help me get out of here, brother. Amen. So anyway, uh, but uh, and we need a bigger. We need a place for be able to check people in. We need a bigger foyer space. We need a place where we can hang out and and be together and, and do life together. These are things we knew we were going to have to do one day. We built this building, tried to cram as much square foot as we could into just getting people out of the weather. But it's time to make a change to it. Now, what I want to do is just take these cards up next week. I, in my life, I'm not in a position to where I have just a big treasure trove of, of money. But I can give some alone. I'm praying that the, Lord, the Lord's, me and Misty, praying about our gift right now. Uh, but you see there on that little card, it, it's real simple. I'll just go over it real quick. I don't want to bog you down. Again, if you're our guest, don't, don't even worry about this, but uh, we're glad you're here today. But there's a, a place where you can, I'll give blank amount today, and that's next Sunday. You can bring an offering, that'd be great. The bank wants us to have X amount of money and all that kind of stuff and know how much we've got people committing to give and, and that kind of thing. So that's primarily why we want to do this. The next one is there's a place for you to give over the next year. And then the under next line, you can either do a week or a month or what you want to give over the next three years. Now, in my case, I'm not doing any of those. What I want to do is I want to give a certain amount this coming year. I may, I may can do, I can't maybe give the same amount every month, but I'm hoping that the Lord opens up a door for us to where I'll, Misty and I'll be able to give significantly more than we can normally afford. I just want you to pray about it. This picture of the children's building, kind of basically what it'll look like over there. If you'll notice, there's already flags stuck out. The, the playground's been took down. It's all, it's all going to go that way. It's going to have an indoor playground in it, big glass front. It'll be a beautiful thing. It'll be a be a community center. We'll use it to help start our next level of the school. Uh, primarily, though, we need it for Sunday mornings. We need more space. We took Candace, Connie, Brother David over to the Avenue Church in Waxahachie this past week. We met with their children's minister. Woman's been there working now for 28 years. She went. She was a member of that church, and there was 300 people in it. Now they run 3,500 on a weekend. And uh, and uh, anyway, she looked at Candace and, and she said, "Did you say y'all were building?" And she said, yeah. And she said, God will fill that space up. Said, you better get ready. You better get, you get ready now for whenever that building's ready for the crowd that God sends to you. And she said, there ain't no doubting about it. It'll happen. And uh, they're building a the big children's building. I'd like to pick it up and stick it right over here, but can't be coveting. Lord said, don't covet another man's wife. Don't covet another preacher's building. But anyhow, and he didn't say the second part, but you can imply it. So anyhow, but I want you to take it, pray about it. If the number's zero, then let it be zero. But I would encourage you to give as you have to give. This is above and beyond your tithe. Y'all are tithing so well. And as a church, we're giving. We're giving more than we've ever gave. Amen. Praise God. Your maturity level is going up through the roof. I know you've been studying stewardship in your life groups this, this past month. I'm not saying you're not giving. I say praise God that you are. 
I'm saying we have an opportunity to do something unique. I don't want to do some big spirit, uh, some big uh, financial campaign. I'm not a fan of those things. I don't want to bring in some outside group to come over, come over, visit at your house, me bring a little picture of the building, and sit over there and jockey with you over money, contact people, don't even come to the church anymore. Just It makes it look like all we're looking for is money. This is the only time I'm going to talk about it. I just think within God's people, if God, if, if, if God is in this, His power will be where His will is, and He will make us a way. Now, I keep saying this, and I'll say it again. It's going to cost about half a meal. If any of y'all just want to give it straight up, let me know today. You can do it anonymously. Just let us know today, Brother Todd, I'm bringing the whole thing next week. Tell everybody else, don't worry about it. Amen. And I ain't, I ain't joking. One day a woman laid a $200,000 check down on my desk and said, will you buy land with this for the church and school? But if not, I'm going to tell you something, guys. $5 a week go a long way. And it's not equal gift. And I know I'm messing around about the half meal. A little bit messing around. <laughs> but, but, it's, it's not equal gift, it's equal sacrifice. The widow, the widow that put in two mites, Jesus said she put in more than anybody else. And I'm going to tell you what. Little widow tithed off a Social Security check, and for me to sit up here and say, let's pray about giving together, the only way I can say that, guys, is if we know the value in it. Pray about it, think about it, I'll leave that with you. Let number five. There's a gentle correction. God doesn't correct Elijah for misinterpreting the situation before he starts to obey, but as soon as he starts to obey, the Lord corrects him, and he does it very gently. He tells him that he had reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees that had not bow, bowed down to Baal, and every mouth that hadn't kissed him. Elijah, there's more going on here, and you know. I'm going to carry us through. But there on your outline, God doesn't want us defeated. God doesn't want us defeated. God's going to make a way for His church to be blessed. I don't know if revival is going to come to the world, but I know it can come to the remnant. And I know we need to be a part of it. I don't know if every church is going to be revived, but we can be. I don't know if every Christian is going to be, but me and you can be. Amen? Amen. If you got that, say, I got it. Last thing. Last thing. There on your outline. You'll have my message for today. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. Would you just write down on the underneath there, where is my mantle? And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. But it's a question. <laughs> you really got bad signals. Where is my mantle? What do I mean by that? You don't see the word mantle. Mantle is an is a upper cloak, kind of like a wrap. They would wrap them around their shoulders. You don't see the word used that often. Once it's used of like a covering for the Lord for all of us, but the other five or six times it's used, it's always used of one of the prophets. Samuel wore a mantle. Elijah wore a mantle. It was a picture of the prophetic office because when God, when Elijah went to anoint Elisha, and Elisha was out there working with the oxen. They was working on the teams, right? They was plowing the ground. And it says that Elijah come by and threw his mantle over Elisha and kept going. And it was in that moment that Elisha turned to him and said, let me do this, let me do this, and I'm on my way. It was a, when, when Elijah was translated, he rolled up his mantle and he struck the river with it and walked through on dry ground. And when Elijah, when Elijah was carried off, his mantle didn't make the trip. It fell off of old Elijah while he was on that chariot of fire and that whirlwind. And Elisha goes and picks it up and he comes back, he rolls it up and he strikes the water and he walks through. It was a picture of his office. If you got that, say, I got it. Let's look back up at verse 13. 
When Elijah, so it was when Elijah heard it, that still small voice, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he stood. What does that mean? One, it, it means respect, reverence. He covered his head. It, especially in the East, then and now. Now those of us more, America has more of a European descent deal to it. We uncover our heads for respect, right? In fact, the Bible even tells a man not to pray with a hat on. Uh, if When I was growing up, you couldn't make two steps into our house with a hat on lest you hear was you raised in a barn. And three steps in, and it didn't matter how bad your feelings got hurt, you'd learn some. Man, to this day, I don't think I've ever ate a meal with a hat on my head. I have a restaurant to take my hat off. You ain't a cowboy sitting there with a cowboy hat on in a restaurant. Can I just get here in your business for a minute? Cotton, picking, boy, what are you doing? Of all hats, a cowboy hat. Sitting there in a restaurant with your head covered up. Man, Lord, did your daddy not teach you no manners? Take it off. Ain't no real cowboy sits in church with a cowboy hat on anyway. I asked Brett Schaefer about it one time. I said, boy, one of these cowboy churches, everybody sitting in church with a hat on. He said, oh, we got a lot of John Waynes here. It was a sign of respect. He covered his head. He, was, he, he recognized he was going out to meet with the Lord. But, but, it, but, he, but more especially, he did not leave his mantle behind. He didn't feel close. He didn't feel encouraged. He, I don't think he felt revived. He gave the Lord the same answer he gave him before he heard the voice. But I like the fact that he never thought about leaving that mantle behind him. That mantle was a picture of God's will in his life. Now you look at me, believer. It ain't always easy to pick up the mantle and go do another day. It ain't always easy to hold in in a ministry when nobody else in the church even seems to know you're doing it or care that you are. If it is what the Lord gave you to do, even if you feel up or you feel down, pick up your mantle and come on. He never thought about leaving that mantle behind him. If he'd have walked to that door, the door of that cave with that mantle laying on the ground, he would have walked out there and told God, I'll come out, but i got no interest in doing this anymore. See, Elijah knew that when the Lord said come to the door, he wanted him to come out of the door and be in his will. And he knew the only way for that to happen was to put his mantle on. i got to be who God wants me to be. It's, it wasn't easy. But he got to the door. When he got to the door and showed the smallest glimmer of obedience, Lord, here I am, man alone. I think everybody's out to kill me. I, 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 I don't think I got the strength, but here I am. And the Lord started to say, go do this, go do this, go do this. Let God make you who God wants you to be. Don't quit. Victory Church, can I talk to you a second? The beginning's over. It's over. The Lord has brought us past that. We're done with it. Yes, we're bearing the heat of the day. This morning I woke up with an odd thought. And that thought was, David, was, how far along am I? And I thought, and I looked at my little gray beard, and I thought, oh, you're looking old. And I thought, I wonder how old I really am. He said, well, Brother Todd, look at your driver's license. No. I was thinking of a sermon old Henry Horton preached years ago about the season of your life and ministry. 
Oh, Brother Henry said, how many of you take 84 years? Now, he's, everybody would say 84 years, and if you like Mamma, she's a 91, 92, so she's a, she's a 91. She said, I wouldn't trade you for 84. But anyway, maybe 84 years of being able to do something ministry-wise, whatever, whatever. But if you take 84 and you divide it by 7, you get to number 12. If those 12 are months of the year, every 7 years of your life is a different month. If you seven, you at the end of January. The Lord Terry is coming and give you 84 years. If you 21, you at the end of March. Does that make sense? I thought, well, Lord, at least I'm coming winter. And then the Lord said, son, I need you to do the math. You're not winter. You're not even fall. You're 50, boy. You just finished July and you end August. And I told the Lord, I said, and that's why it feels like I'm bearing the heat of the day, doesn't it? See, that's where I'm at. In a lot of ways, church, that's where we are. We in the work now. It's not all what it's going to be. It's, it's, it's some of what it's been. There's heartache. There's disappointments. There's loss. There's pain. When I was a boy, my daddy taught me how to work. You start off, you got to make the whole day. You can't do it all in the first hour. You work with me, Troy, or Trey, we don't take official breaks. If you thirsty, go get a drink. You need to get your air? Get your air. But just keep going. I thought about how James Peavy and Margie Cagle taught me that. Just go. I went to the fire department. It was guys like Chuck Dennis, Kevin Farmer. Taught me when it's hot, you just hold. Five seconds. Some fires, they used to say you got to put them out five seconds at a time. Because your body's saying go, but you... Mine says, I can stay here five more seconds. And when you get them five down, I can stay five more seconds. When I used to run in athletics, I would I'd pick out a place way off ahead of me. And I'd say, I, Angie, I ain't going to slow down until I get that signpost. And when I get to that signpost, I'd pick me out something else. I'd say, I ain't going to slow down until I get to there. One step at a time. Victory Church, you hear me. You young in the life or you are you older? You these older folks will tell you it's a matter of keeping going. It's a matter of staying in prayer, staying in the word, keep going, hearts broke, trust God, keep moving. Keep pushing. And then one day, in the Lord's good time, and he'll walk us that last mile of the way. Don't get me wrong. I, I look forward to heaven, but I'm glad I'm here. I don't want to be a soldier that says I just want to be somewhere else. I want to recognize this is my time. I want to do good in my time. I want to be like David, who discovered the purposes of God and then fell on sleep, Danny. That's what Peter said about him. Let's don't stop. I know people can discourage you. and Even in church, somebody might can say something mean to you. May, that's just trying to get you in a cave, baby. You keep your man alone. You say, Brother Todd, these, these folks here don't like me. These, these people make fun of me. Oh, amen. They made fun of the prophets. They made fun of the, they made fun of the apostles. One brother looked at the apostle Paul, called him a bad man. Said, much learning has made you mad. Said, you, you crazy. Oh, Paul just kept going. Put him in chains, kept going. Till the time that he glorified the Lord in his own death. If the Lord is worth it, then he's worth the heat of the day. He's worth the sacrifice. I ain't got a lot of money in the bank. I got more now than I've ever had. But I ain't got a whole lot. But I got a whole lot of money 
in church building. I got a whole lot of money in tithe. I got a whole lot of money laid up. I got a whole lot of money in hungry people, cold widows. I got a lot of money in orphans. I got a lot of money in missionaries. I got a lot of money in church treasury. Money I left on the table. Because it was the king's cause at the time. And Danny, I'll take the swap. I'll take the swap. You say, Brother Todd... You live like that, you won't lay up much for your kids. I put built my kids on the rock. I'm telling you, it's worth it. This ain't some kid up here saying it now. This is a dude in August. I buried so many. I've seen so much heartbreak. I've lost so many as a pastor that I couldn't help stay on a narrow way. I got more disappointments and I got successes, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, Jody. That mantle's going to stay on me. Lord did too much for me for me to lay my mantle down. I started off in ministry. We had got going and we didn't have a thing. God had led me out of the first church I'd ever pastored. I had no money. I had no job. I was in the shop trying to set the shop back up. Grandpa had told me that, uh, he said, Todd, if you want to start, Papa would close the shop down. He said, he said Todd, I'll take 10%. That's all I'll take. You can have 90% of what the shop does. I wasn't doing nothing but off his name anyway. I was setting it back up. It was Saturday. Nothing was working right. Everything was broke. I was working on a line board machine that I know the devil himself had to have a thousand demons in. And I was sitting there, and my brothers was off. They was messing around playing, throwing a ball somewhere out there in the pasture. Hollering. I just I don't remember what they're saying. It's hollering about something. If you ever watch PB's play ball, we hollering. We hollering because we're happy. We're hollering because we're mad, but we're hollering. And I was sitting down drinking a cup of coffee. And I said, Lord, if I messed up, if I got a wife, two kids, we got nothing. And I, I had the radio on. This old southern gospel song come on. A little old gal started singing about it. Lord, I'll, I'll go on for you because you kept going for me. You walked all the way up Calvary. I know. It's one of them times in your life, guys, Mike Phelps, where you know God sent something just for you in that moment. And I told the Lord then, I said, Lord, don't ever let a, a doubt ever cross my mind again about quitting. I've been thin, and I've been fooled. I have abounded, and I have been abased. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't trade it Dalton and Hillary for nothing. It ain't nothing but the fight. It ain't nothing but the attack. Victory Church, if we're going to be anything real at all, we've got to know some heat of the day. We got to know some sacrifice. We got to know some push. Let's be one of the churches that walks into glory with our man alone. Y'all following me? Would you bow your head with me? You're here. Hello. Today. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope there was something that happened during the the message, or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus, the Son of God, said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. 
One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He seeks us and He calls us and He draws us to Himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're, as you listen to the Word of God, you're, you're feeling Him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you, if God's moving you, to, to accept a challenge or uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that He's going to uh, help you, that He loves you, and that you're one of His children. Sometimes, as He talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes He does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see His Son as the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's, he knows what he's talking about. He's, if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He paid that price. He rose from the grave. He's alive, and he can give us life. And the Bible tells us that when we, when we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, He enters into our life, He makes us His child, and He begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that He's rose from, uh, for us, that He wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the Word of God. You hear belief. And you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it. And we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him. And we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear so to speak loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of god into your life but it's real and if you understand if uh the things we talked about today in the message what i'm talking about right now if god's calling you then you know exactly what i'm talking about you need to come to that point of decision um and the way you do that is to pray now you don't need my help to do it you can right now just ask the lord to Forgive your sins. Tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross. He rose from the grave. That, that you want to repent of sin, turn from sin, and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith, and he will save you. The Bible says, for as many as have received him, and those that want to believe on him, the Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say... Preacher, I don't really know what to say. In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. 
I'll try to follow you to be my Savior because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word and help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and just say amen. And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else. But uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net, and you found us here on the internet so i imagine you can probably find our homepage. just find us send us a note there's a way there to contact us you can call the church uh if you're where you can get to a call or call into america it's 972-452-3751 and you can give us a call and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next i'm so proud for you so glad for you if if, if you can come back and be with us the next uh, simulcast, uh, the next podcast that goes out. Remember that uh, all of our, our videoed messages and even a lot of our audio messages are online. Uh, you'll find them archived uh, there in the website. If there's anything we can do for you, we'll try our best to do it. God bless you. We love you. And thanks again for coming by today. Hello. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope there was something that happened during the, the message or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that, uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus, the Son of God, said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He seeks us and He calls us and He draws us to Himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're, as you listen to the Word of God, you're, you're feeling Him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you, if God's moving you, to, to accept a challenge or uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that he's going to uh, help you, that he loves you, and that you're one of his children. Sometimes, as he talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes he does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see his son as the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's... He knows what he's talking about. He's, if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He paid that price. He rose from the grave. He's alive, and he can give us life. And the Bible tells us that when we... When we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, he enters into our life, he makes us his child, and he begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that he's rose from, uh, for us, that he wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the Word of God. You hear belief 
and you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it, and we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place, and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the Word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him. And we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear, so to speak. Loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of God into your life. But it's real, and if you understand if uh, the things we talked about today in the message, what I'm talking about right now, if God's calling you, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You need to come to that point of decision. Um, and the way you do that is to pray. Now, you don't need my help to do it. You can right now just ask the Lord to forgive your sins, tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross, he rose from the grave, that, that you want to repent of sin, turn from sin, and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith, and he will save you. The Bible says for as many as have received him, and those that want to believe on him, the Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say, preacher, I don't really know what to say. In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. I'll try to follow you, to be my Savior, because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word and help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and just say amen. And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else, but uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net, and you found us here on the Internet, so I imagine you can probably find our homepage. Just find us, send us a note. There's a way there to contact us. You can call the church. Uh, if you're where you can get to a call or call into America, it's 972-452-3751. And you can give us a call, and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next. I'm so proud for you, so glad for you. If, if, if you can, come back and be with us at the next uh, simulcast, uh, the next podcast that goes out. Remember that uh, all of our, our videoed messages and even a lot of our audio messages are online. Uh, you'll find them archived uh, there in the website. If there's anything we can do for you, we'll try our best to do it. God bless you. We love you. And thanks again for coming by today.